This is Power of the Streets, a podcast series brought to you by Human Rights Watch about how we speak truth to power. I'm Audrey Kawire Wabwire and I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya. We've been hearing from some of the people driving Africa's Me Too movement, and that journey now takes us to the LGBT migrant community in South Africa. Everyone we speak to in this series has a second, a minute, or an hour when they realize that they need to make a change. The moment when they decide to step up and rise. Homosexuality or it's it's just a it's that elephant in the room, that issue that nobody ever wants to address or ever talk about. So I, I I didn't know. I didn't know anything. I just knew that I felt differently from the way that everybody else my age was feeling, you know, and I didn't know what to make of it. I didn't know who to talk to about it. I didn't know who to ask. So it was it was really confusing. Tomas Shamuyarira is a transgender man born and raised in Zimbabwe, and he's been living in South Africa for 10 years. He speaks about the hardships of growing up in a country where sexual orientation and gender identity outside of being heterosexual and cisgender is frowned upon and even taboo. I just had to try and just be like everybody else. Do the things that the other girls my age were doing just so that I could, yeah, fit in. But... Even though I did my very best, I just knew that that was not that was not me, you know. That was not who I was, and yeah, I just had to figure things out. And and how did you get to learn more about yourself? Was there a person you met? You know, you're saying there were no books, magazines. How did you then? You know, what was the journey? How did the journey begin to find yourself? Okay, so yeah, um, in high school I had a best friend. I, she thought we were best friends, but for me it was obviously more than that. I had other feelings for her, other than those of of, of friendship. I I I loved her, actually, and yeah. So for her it was just oh okay, we are very close. We are best friends, and we always. We are always together. We're doing everything together. We spend th- most of our time together. And for me, it was something else. So uh, then I knew, okay, that that I was different because obviously at that point, every other girl my age was into boys. They were starting to fall in love with boys. But for me, it was just not the same. I didn't know what it means still at that point. And then I think how I came to discover or to actually figure out what it meant, what I was, and was way after high school when I met a masculine presenting woman who is um, a lesbian. So I think they're called butch lesbians or studs. I met her. I didn't know what what. She was also at that point, but I just saw her and I sort of like saw myself in her, you know, like what I've always wanted to, I mean, like how I've always wanted to dress, how I've always wanted to present myself. I saw that in 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 that person. So I approached her and I spoke to her and her being a female that is attracted to other females she thought she assumed when she saw me walk up to her that i liked her in that way but for me it was just like oh that person you know i i just want to be friends with her so that you know i don't know we can just be friends because i see myself in her so the two exchanged phone numbers and continued chatting she introduced me to girls so there was actually a function happening at their at their premises and she took me there like i think a day or two after we met and yeah my life changed <laughs> that's when i i just knew like when i got there i was shocked they were like boys that looked like girls they were girls that looked like boys they were just a whole you know 
that was just a whole different world for me. So from there, that's when I started learning. From there, that's when I started to get an understanding to say, oh, okay, so what I am is lesbian and I'm, I'm, I'm putting air quotes. I'm using air quotes here, but you can't see me, obviously. So like I was like, oh, okay, so if I'm a girl that is attracted to other girls, then that means I'm a lesbian. And then there's, you know, and if boys that are attracted to other boys, they're called gay and, and all of that. So the moment that I met her, I mean, that's, I can say that's when the education or the, the journey began for me to understanding who I was, to getting to where I am today. I think meeting that, that person was the beginning of everything for me. Mm, mm. So, so finding that community and, you know, something that you've never been exposed to before was it were these like friends who you know your family knew about and so how was that journey between you know you finding um this new family and your family at home yeah so yeah um i started dating this 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 girl that was very out and very proud so, you know, you're in the closet and you're dating somebody who is out and proud. They can't be pulled back into the closet for any reason. And you can't come out of the closet that quick because, you know, you have to, there's, there's a lot of things that you need to consider before you put yourself out there. So, yeah, people started talking and my sister heard about it. And then also, yeah, somebody had told my mom also about me being seen with people that look very suspicious, boys that look like girls and girls that look like boys. And my mom approached me and asked me about it at some point, and I denied it that they were just there. We just happened to be in the same place at the same time, but we were not together, you know. So, yeah, so one time me and my sister had a fight, and then she sort of like just told my mom that I was a lesbian because she was very angry with me. So my mom, because she had also been hearing all of these things from different people, she then, she, she, she didn't even have to ask me because it made sense, you know? And yeah, that's, that's how it caught up with me. I was then disowned in instantly, like disowned kicked out and told never to come back and told that i was a disgrace to the human race to the family you know so <laughs> it yeah it's funny now but then back then it was it it, it wasn't it wasn't funny at all yeah mm, mm. okay okay um in this series we are focusing on the me too movement in africa and the violence faced by LGBT people is an important part of this movement. And you're an activist in South Africa. Your work revolves around supporting migrant LGBT people. But, you know, before we go into that, tell me about your migration story. Why did you decide to leave a place that was home? Um, okay, it wasn't really a personal decision, but then, you know, like after I was disowned and kicked out, then my mom, I think after a year plus, yeah, after almost two years, she then, I don't know what it was, okay, then she just called me out of the blue and then instructed me to come back home. So, yeah, where I was wasn't nice so I was like okay I know that if I go back home it's not going to be the same obviously but yeah I'm in hell already now with this person in this place so which hell is better than the other you know so I just made the decision like okay since she said I must come home let me go I have nothing to lose so I went back home and as I predicted, home wasn't home anymore. It wasn't nice. It wasn't comfortable. It wasn't good for me. The people in the area also, they, they had heard about why I was disowned and why I was kicked out. So everybody was talking and also at home, like, it was very difficult for my mom to accept 
and to understand like how is it even possible like where did you get it in the family they've not heard about it nobody else is like me so why me you know so it was very difficult for me and I, for her but she she called you to come back home didn't she know that you know you'll just come back as yourself or what was the understanding there i don't know maybe it was like okay so you've learned your lesson uh, yeah like it wasn't it wasn't home anymore i wasn't free to laugh i wasn't free to just be you know a child in 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 their mom's house you know it wasn't like that so uh there came a point where i i have a sister who was already living here in sa so she had a tenant that was going to open a business a, a hair salon so she needed people to to help her with that so my sister then knew that i was there at home not doing anything and she told my mom about this person and this this opportunity so yeah they were like okay yes i can come to south africa only if i promise that i will stop this thing <laughs> or that if i promise that i was going to change and i was going going to look at women the way that i looked at women and and stuff you know so what options did i have i made the promise i said i was going to change i said i wasn't going to do it anymore i said i was going to be the best daughter ever i was going to do my best so yeah after making those promises then yeah the arrangements were made and i came to sa so yeah i was living with my sister and i was working with with this woman at this hair salon but then i this wasn't a good idea was it putting me in a place where women <laughs> <laughs> Of course you are going to, you know, fall in love. Oh god, of all the places to to put a to put a, a lesbian identifying woman, put them in a place where different kinds of women walk in every single day. Yeah, so I fell in love with someone. <laughs> and this was like barely a month after I moved here, you know, and after making the promise that I would never do it again. So yeah obviously the woman was a straight woman she was not a lesbian she was just attracted to men and yeah you know how it is wanting something that you can never have it's it's crazy but then because you want it so much you're willing to die or do anything and try your very best to get it so that's the pre predicament that I found myself in I fell in love with a straight girl and You know when you like somebody you can hide that you like somebody but when you love when you're in love with someone it's you you cannot hide that you can do your best but then you just fail you know so that's what happened I fell in love with this woman and yeah my sister ended up finding out she kicked me out she found out it was a girl and she kicked me out so luckily the lady now that that I was working for the one with the hair salon she was like you're going to kick her out where is she going to go because then you know we are working but then we're not making in a lot of money yet at the salon and i'm not paying her enough how is she going to survive you know so i'm going to go with her and then we're going to look for a place and we're going to share so that i can help out so my sister was like good riddance just just get out the both of you you know so we left and then i started leaving with her so yeah that's that's how i ended up here while living in zimbabwe tomaz was automatically identified as a lesbian because he was seen as a woman attracted to other women but he always felt masculine and he wanted to express himself in that way it was only when he moved to south africa where he discovered the term transgender and this unleashed his confidence to begin transitioning and so you like many other lgbt africans migrate to south africa why is this why is it well <laughs> it's the easiest place for us to get to number one, and then it's also like 
it's not a criminal offense to be yourself here, to be gay, to be trans, to be queer, to be lesbian, to be bisexual. You can be yourself freely in this country, which is why it is, which is why we, we everybody, even until today, there are so many LGBT people that are in their countries that criminalize homosexuality that wish or that hope to get to SA one day, you know, because of that. That's all we want. We don't want so much. We just want the freedom to be ourselves, you know, that chance to just love who we want to love freely and not have somebody arresting you for that. You know, we can be ourselves here. I think that's why. And also the economy here is is thriving compared to other African countries. So, yeah. Now, well, now that, you know, considering those factors, um, now now that you're like someone is there at the border, is it easy to get the process of gaining asylum as an African LGBT migrant? Um, what's that like exactly? It is very complicated. <laughs> um, okay, so this is how the whole process or system is supposed to work. You are supposed to state at the port of entry your intentions of seeking asylum, right? But then um, people actually opt to just get in as a tourist or as a as a visitor and then they um find their way once they they they've settled in so from my understanding from the conversations that we've had with people is that um one it's scary you, you never know you know you never know who you're going to talk to. You don't know how they're going to receive you and you don't know if they're actually willing, they're going to be willing to to take you through the process if they actually want you to proceed, you know. This is the very, very wrong way of doing it. But then again, what options or what other choice do people have? Because you don't want to be sent back. That is the worst thing that can ever happen to you. Yeah, I I can see that you know dilemma of trying to do it legally or going back home to face violence, potential violence. Yeah, you know, like going back to whatever it is that you were running away from. So then the process then again now is once you get in, you now need to follow the process where you go to a refugee reception office and then state your case and. Yeah, that is also not very easy because we've had cases or situations where people were asked to prove that they're really gay or people were asked why they are gay, you know. There's just no way to do that. Like they need proof of why you're escaping. Yeah, so for example, you need to come with a... Because then you you, you have to have gone through an ordeal where maybe you were attacked and then you uh, 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 reported the case or so you have to have maybe the the police reports or maybe there was an incident and then you ended up in the papers, in the newspaper, so you have to bring a newspaper article and say, look at this, you know. Uh, yeah, that is, that is really difficult because, you know, you were saying that you are leaving home. You are afraid of, you know, people's words turning into something physical, but they want proof of something physical. What it is, is the fact that the constitution of your country says criminalizes homosexuality. That's reason enough for you to leave and come and seek asylum here, you know. That's reason enough for you to leave and go seek asylum anywhere else. Now, let's go back to your... Um, activism. When you look at your childhood and your experiences as a migrant, what's the exact moment that pushed you to speak up and become an activist? Was it a moment or a series of events? If something happens, 
especially if it's something bad. I always imagine how people that are less, let me not say less privileged, that are more disadvantaged than I am, I always imagine how they are dealing with the situation or coping with that situation. Because me, with the little advantage that I have, I'm actually struggling. What more somebody, you know, else? So it was always that for me. The fruit basket, like, was was born out of, I always want to say, frustration and passion. My passion to want to help people. And then the frustration of not knowing who to turn to when I need assistance, like going to people to look for certain assistance and people not knowing how to help me and referring me to the next person and the next person actually saying, why did they send you to me? Because, you know, type of type of situation. And then I was just like, okay, I am here now in this situation, in this foreign land. What do I do? Okay, so I am not a professional. I, I don't have the experience. I know nothing at all about all of these issues, you know. I am still trying to figure things out. I am still trying to figure myself out. But then again, okay, so in the process of me figuring things out, in the process of me trying to find out what to do to get what I want, in the process of me just trying to find a way to survive in this foreign land why don't i just create something a platform that can then as i get help for myself i get it for everybody else at the same time you know well that's that's really inspiring to me that's really admirable um how you've come to where you are and you know talking about your organization the fruit basket you just mentioned it you do a lot of impressive work for migrant LGBT people in South Africa. Tell me more about the organization. Um, what, what exactly do you do um, and, and what have you achieved so far? So I created the fruit basket so that LGBT asylum seekers and refugees like myself can just have that place where they can run to whatever challenge or whatever problem that they may be facing, we now act as a referral system. So if somebody comes with whatever challenge and we are unable to help them as the fruit basket, we know where to direct them to. We know that if they can go to a certain place or a certain organization with a reference saying that the fruit basket referred us to you they will be able to get that kind that assistance you know this is like a practical solution oh okay you need a place to stay i'm gonna help you to get a place to stay you need food to eat okay we're going to do our best to help you to get food that's what we are focusing on on at the moment providing practical solutions to people's challenges that they're facing on a daily basis we want to focus on you know helping with with this documentation issue because then if you start looking at people and the problems that they're facing most of them come from this you know this is like the root of of all the problems that's where they're coming from yeah and as you're winding up you know you're pretty busy Thomas um you're doing a lot of work really cool stuff how are you taking care of yourself Okay, so for me, like, I, I love, I love, 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 love working out more than anything. So I do work out. I, I run, like, almost every morning, five kilometers. That helps me a lot. Five kilometers? I know. Oh. I do, yes. Mm. That really helps me a lot. I work out. I, uh, but I know I, I need to, I need to to do more like i need to talk to professionals <laughs> because last year i got married yeah. this was in july Aww. and then in november everything just came crumbling down and i'm not married anymore so you know i think that goes <laughs> i think i need to contact a guinness world a, a world record so they can just put mine as the shortest marriage in the history of marriages i oh, know yeah so that that i have not dealt with that yet mm. and i you know like like a lot of 
like good things and bad things happened at the same time mm. and i didn't know and i still don't know how to feel you know like by my divorce and my top surgery happened two days apart oh and the united nations innovation award that the fruit basket won the announcement came i think about a few days after that you know so it's like the worst thing and the best thing happened at the same time and i don't know how to feel you know like i i'm like okay so do, do i celebrate my surgery that i've wanted for the longest time that i've waited for mm. uh oh okay i just got divorced oh wow this oh i just won we just won this this big award we just got the recognition and the visibility that we've always wanted mm -hmm. You know, like, so at the moment, I don't know. I just feel like one day I will just explode. And <laughs> yeah. so, yeah. Okay. Tomas, what's your message for other activists doing the work of protecting LGBT people from violence on the continent? First of all, thank you guys for the work that you do. It is essential, you know. Um, sometimes people just need that person to look up to that person that can just stand in front of them and then lead them and take them to wherever that they 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 want to go and you guys are doing that and you guys are that are those people for for the communities that you serve you've been listening to power of the streets a podcast series brought to you by human rights watch i'm audrey kawire wabwire in nairobi kenya that's the end of our show. Check out our show notes for more about Tomas and his work at the Fruit Basket. In the next episode, we'll take the conversation to Ethiopia. To learn more about Human Rights Watch, visit hrw.org. Follow us on Twitter at hrw and on Instagram at Human Rights Watch for updates about the show. Join the conversation using the hashtag Power of the Streets and share your thoughts with Tomas or any of our other guests and you can tell us how you're speaking truth to power. Our producer is Andy C. Wemey, and this is a volume production. The main theme song, Au Revoir, was produced by Young OG Beats. Till next time, thank you for listening.